So we are going to have a lecture on the fetal period of development. Uh, this is a brief lecture really, just to capture a few aspects of what happened during the fetal period of development. It will be a brief one. Then after that, we are going to look at another one, which is basically the principles of teratology. Again, brief. So both sessions should not take us more than one hour. So let's start with this one, fetal period of development. So just as a matter of introduction, if you remember this storyline, told you that we can divide the prenatal developmental periods into two, the things that take place before conception, that is gametogenesis and fertilization, and the things that take place after conception, that period can be divided into three. The pre-embryonic period refers to the first 14 days after conception. The embryonic period referred to week three until week eight after conception, during which we have organogenesis, development of body organs. After week eight, we talk of week nine until birth. And that's what you call the fetal period of development. So much of embryology really fall under the embryonic period where we talk about the development of systems according to their systems. And that will do in each system that we'll be handling. We've done others, others will be doing them. But I want to say something about what happened during the fetal period of development. I'll begin with the characteristics of the fetal period of development. So we've said this is the period from nine weeks until birth, and we are counting from the time of conception. This period from nine weeks until birth is characterized by the following. It is a period of rapid growth of the body organs. So remember, organogenesis has taken place. Body organs have formed. Now these body organs now grow rapidly during this period. And because of this rapid growth of body organs, there is marked increase in the height and weight of the baby. So those two go together. Because of the rapid growth of the body organs, the height and weight of the baby increases rapidly or markedly. I want us to debate the predominant mechanisms that underlie the growth of the organs. In the first trimester, the key mechanism that underlies the growth of the organs is basically cell division. So we have a numerical increase in the number of cells. Growth by numerical increase in the number of cells is other is known as hyperplasia. So hyperplasia becomes the key mechanism in the first trimester of pregnancy. In the third trimester of pregnancy, the predominant mechanism is not necessarily hyperplasia, but hypertrophy. And hypertrophy is the increase in size of now the individual cells. So I want you to pick it that in the first trimester, it is more of cell division taking place and so the number of cells increase. That is the predominant mechanism. In the third trimester, the predominant mechanism is the cells which are already there now increase in their individual size. That does not mean that we don't have cell division in the third trimester. Neither does it mean that we do not have hypertrophy in the first trimester. I'm using the terms cautiously the predominant mechanism. In the second trimester, we have both mechanisms almost playing 50-50 role. 
So hyperplasia and hypertrophy participating. And because of that, there'll be rapid growth in body organs, which increases, which causes rapid increase in height and weight of the baby. Part of the reason why weight gain is there is because of also accumulation of calcium as well as iron. During this time, the baby accumulates a lot of calcium and a lot of iron. And because of that, there'll be increase in weight. The fetal period is also a period of fat deposition. So the baby deposits a lot of fat in the subcutaneous tissues so that the skin of the baby become relatively smooth from wrinkled skin to very smooth skin. If a baby was to be born prematurely, the skin would appear really wrinkled because fat deposition is not yet complete. But a term baby usually have very smooth skin because the, the fat in the subcutaneous region is adequate and so the skin is stretched, appears very smooth. The fetal period of development is also a period of ossification. As we talked about earlier in other class, ossification is formation of bone. Now we know that bone form from two key mechanisms. We have endochondral ossification, which is formation of long bones. And this happens through the laying down of cartilage first. Then you have intramembranous ossification, which is formation of flat bones. And this is largely after laying down a connective tissue membrane that then transform into bone. So whether intramembranous or endochondral ossification, ossification is predominantly a process of the fetal period of development. The flat bones like those of the skull will develop from intermembranous ossification. The long bones like those of the limbs develop from endochondral ossification. So here we have images showing us the flat bones, the skull that develop from intermembrane ossification and the long bones of the limbs which develop from endochondral ossification. Apart from those characteristics that uh, we've mentioned that characterize the fetal period development, the other thing I want to mention that also characterize the fetal period of development is what is represented in these images that during the fetal period of development, we have reduced head dominance. That needs to be understood from a relative point of view rather than from an absolute point of view. Relative to mean that we are comparing the size of the head with the size of the whole person rather than absolute size of the head. Of course, if you compare the absolute size of the head, definitely the head increases in size progressively. But if you compare the relative size, then we can say that the head reduces in its dominance. And the images shown here perhaps capture that in a graphic way. In the first image, we see this baby who is three months old. And guess what? The head is half the size of the whole baby the head is very prominent. Two months later, what happened? That head that was half the whole body is now a third the whole person. So it has reduced, although that's still big if you compare what you have, that is still quite big. At the time of birth, nine months later, the head takes just a quarter of the whole person. So I told you, don't look at it absolutely, then say the head becomes small, because that may not be true. The head of a, a term baby is definitely bigger than the head of a three-month-old baby. 
but we are comparing the size of the head compared with the size of the whole body. So at the time of birth, the head is about half, sorry, about a quarter of the whole person. I'm giving you 20 seconds to think about the situation in you at the moment. Okay, so these are the characteristics of the fetal period of development. What are some of the factors that may influence the growth of the fetus? There are a number of factors that can influence the growth of the fetus. We can't really list all of them, but let me try to classify them according to the factors, then perhaps this will give us a better overview of these factors. There are those factors which are considered genetic. They are within the genes. Either they are passed down from family tree, a long family tree, or maybe they're just mutations which have occurred. If they are passed down along family trees, maybe they involve a whole race or a whole tribe or a whole particular geographical region. They're still within the genetics. Then apart from genetic factors, we also have hormonal factors. So the hormones which are circulating affect the development of the fetus. This could be the maternal hormones. Could also be the fetal hormones, but either way, they affect the development of the fetus. We also have the environmental factors. And indeed here, there are many things to consider. It could be the uterine environment, which means maybe there are fibroids in this uterus. Maybe there is oligodramnions. All those things will affect development. But could also be the environment of the mother. Maybe the mother is sick. Maybe the mother has some particular conditions. Those ones also affect the development of the fetus. Could be the lifestyle of the mother. Maybe she's a smoker. Maybe she takes alcohol a lot. All those things are likely to affect the development of the baby. So I've told you those factors in general rather than being specific because being specific would mean that uh, the cows will come back home and we'll still be talking about them. But importantly, I want us to then talk about how do we assess the growth of the baby? And I want to apply this from an anatomical point of view. I want to approach it from an anatomical point of view. In terms of assessment of fetal growth, we can assess the growth of the fetus by estimating the height of the uterine fundus. We call that fundal height. How far from the pubic symphysis is the height of the uterine fundus? So this is based on the understanding that the bigger the baby, the larger the uterus and the higher the fundus. Therefore, the fundal height will just estimate the size of the uterus. But in extrapolation, therefore, estimation of the size of the uterus means estimation of the possible size of the baby. And uh, Estimation of the possible size of the baby would then mean estimation perhaps of the how long the pregnancy has been there in terms of weeks. 
So how we do this is uh, a pregnant woman just lies supine and then you palpate the hand and the aim is to fill this region, the region where you cannot go beyond the uterus. So that becomes the fundal height. In terms of interpretation, we know, and you'll be taught this later, that there are some regions where the fundal height could be reaching and it means something. For example, the fundal height that just reaches the pubic symphysis, just above the pubic symphysis, which means the uterus is just reaching the abdomen from the pelvis. That would correspond with a 20, sorry, a 12 weeks pregnancy as opposed to a 20 to 22 weeks pregnancy where it reaches the umbilicus or a term pregnancy and 36 is term, a term pregnancy that reaches the xiphoid process of the stomach. So that is estimation by the fundal height. Then you have estimation by phytoscopy. This one does not particularly estimate the gestational age, not really, but it estimates the number of heartbeat in one minute. So you can just call that on the fetal heart rate. Well, apart from just estimating the fetal heart rate, by the presence of the fetal heart, rate, it tells us something vital. It tells us that the baby is alive. So we can use fetoscopy to determine viability. Is the baby alive or dead? If you put the fetoscope and you hear sound, the fetal heart rate, the baby is definitely alive. If someone is pregnant and use the fetoscopy to feel the heart rate and you cannot listen to the heart rate, then it means perhaps the baby is not lying in the appropriate place or the baby is struggling to be alive or the baby is not alive. Or maybe the maternal anterior abdominal wall has a lot of thick tissue and so you can't hear. The message I want to put across to you is that Phytoscopy is a good one in terms of its positive side. That if you hear the heart rate, it means there is a activity so, so the baby is alive. And you can also count the number of beats in one minute and you can determine if it's normal or abnormal. But if we put this and we don't hear, it may mean many things. And that will warrant therefore the next course of action, which is perhaps to do an ultrasound. But generally, phytoscopy will estimate the fetal heart rate. It may also tell us how many babies could be there based on where you hear the loudest sound for the fetal heart rate. You might be hearing multiple fetal heart rate heart activity in multiple sites and that can allude towards multiple pregnancy. Anyway, now let's talk about assessment by ultrasound. Ultrasonography is very key in obstetrics because it provides a lot of information that phytoscopy or fundal height determination couldn't really help to provide. There are a number of things that ultrasound imaging can provide. For example, ultrasound will tell us viability. Ultrasound will be able to see the fetal cardiac activity, and then we conclude that the baby is alive. Ultrasound is also able to see whether the heart rate is regular. Ultrasound is able to tell us the number of heartbeats in one minute. Apart from heart rate, ultrasound can also tell us about the number of babies. Is it a single-tone pregnancy? Is it multiple pregnancy? If it's multiple pregnancy, 
which type is it? Ultrasound is able to tell us whether they are mono amniotic twins like those ones or the amniotic dichorionic twins like the first two images. So that is the number of babies. Ultrasound can also tell us the fetal presentation. The image here shows you two different types of fetal presentation. On the first one, fetal presentation just means which part of the baby is approaching the birth canal first. We like doing this during the third trimester because once um, the baby has turned in some particular position beyond some weeks, then they're unlikely to change in their position again. So in particular, if you look at this ultrasound, the maternal pelvis usually here, the maternal head is on this side. So this head of the fetus is facing the maternal pelvis. This baby is coming with the head. We call that a cephalic presentation. As opposed to the image on your right where the maternal pelvis is here, the head region is this other side. This baby is coming with the buttocks. This is called breech presentation. Breech is B-R-E-E-C-H. Apart from that, ultrasound can tell us placentation. Where is the placenta attached? In the first image, we see this the ultrasound probe, then the anterior abdominal wall of the mother, then this is the uterine wall, then the whole of this is the placenta, which means what the placenta is anterior. The second one shows placenta, which is on the lower part of the, of the uterus. And in this case, obscuring the internal os. So this is placenta previa. So I've told you ultrasound can tell us placentation. Where is the placenta? How, what the size of the placenta? How thick is it? Um, how many placenta are they? And uh, is there separation? Ultrasound can also tell us what we call amniotic fluid index. We discussed amniotic fluid index last week. We said this is the estimation of the amount of amniotic fluid. Usually we measure four pockets, then we add, and we give it in centimeter. So in the first image, the fluid volume is quite a lot. This is polydramnions. On the second image, we hardly see any pocket of fluid, perhaps that or that. And this is what we call oligohydramnions. So you'll remember that uh, we mentioned that we make a diagnosis of oligodramnions if the amniotic fluid index is less than five centimeter. If it is between five to eight, we call that borderline low and eight to 20 is normal. If it's between 20 to 21, 25, we call that borderline high and above 25 is polyhydramnions. Finally, as we talk about the fetal period of development, I want us to talk about how we estimate the fetal age. How do we know how old the baby is using ultrasound? Okay, let's discuss about all of them first, then we'll talk about using ultrasound. How do we know how long the pregnancy has lasted? The easiest is just to ask the mother, when was your last normal menstrual period? So the lady will give you a date. You need to ascertain that the date they have given you was the first day of the last normal menstrual period. You also need to ascertain that that date she's given you was not necessarily the implantation bleed, but actually the menstrual flow. And you determine that by just asking how long did the flow last? So if they tell you it was spotting lasting one day, most likely that was implantation bleed. If they tell you it, I changed uh, three to four parts in a day and it lasted three to four days or five days, then that was menstrual flow. So once you estimate the gestation by date, just checking how many weeks and days have passed since the last normal menstrual period of this woman, that becomes gestation by date. Then we have gestation by fundal height. 
So this is where you palpate and we fill the upper end of the fundus. Then you just give it it's, uh, to the nearest uh, week in even numbers according to what you've gotten from the palpation. So you realize that this one is very inaccurate for it to give us odd numbers and also very inaccurate for it to give us days. But gestation by dates can give us days. It can maybe just not give us hours. Then lastly, we can estimate fetal age using ultrasound. And that's what I want us to discuss. So estimation using ultrasound recognizes whether the baby is in the first trimester or second and third trimester. In the first trimester, we estimate using two measurements. The first one is measuring the diameter of the gestational sac. So we call it mean sac diameter. How it's done is that the machine is uh, put over the site of the pregnancy, and then the size of the gestational sac is measured in three orthogonal planes. Once the measurements have been taken three orthogonal planes, the machine itself will calculate the average for you. So that is mean sac diameter. The bigger the sac, the bigger the pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. Then the second way in which we estimate fetal age by ultrasound is using what you call the crown ramp length. This is the crown, this is the ramp. So we basically measure the length of the baby, but remember without the limbs, because at this time the limbs have not yet formed. These are the two measurements which are used in the first trimester to estimate the fetal age. Now we can look at the parameters that ultrasound uses and reliably so to estimate the age of the baby if the ossification has already taken place, which means that uh, we are looking at estimation in the second and the third trimester. So there are four dimensions or measurements which can be taken. The first one is femoral length. It simply means the length of the femur. The second one is called the head circumference together with bipartal diameter. So bipartal diameter is this diameter from one parietal bone to another parietal bone through the thalami. The head circumference is the distance, the average distance around the head. In this particular plane of the thalami on both ends and the falx cerebri, this structure here in the middle. Last but not least, we also estimate the how long the baby has been there by estimating the size of the abdomen of the fetus. And we call that abdominal circumference. So we need those four parameters in the second and third trimester to also compute the estimated weight of the baby. Femoral length, by a parietal diameter, head circumference, and abdomen circumference. Right, thank you very much. So that marks the end of the first part, which was on fetal period of development. So I'll give you time to ask questions if you do have.